discussions about systematic racism and policing often happen in the same breath. How to best police? A key topic. The Indiana University Police Department recently announced a 17-year police veteran will head its diversity and community engagement efforts. In this We Stand Together report, Katira Winfrey speaks to Wayne James. The path to becoming Indiana University Police Department's first chief diversity officer for Wayne James started in Gary, Indiana, working with a local police force before transitioning to Indiana University Northwest. He stayed there for 11 years. Now he calls Bloomington home as he takes up his duties as the assistant VP and deputy superintendent for law enforcement operations across every IU campus. It's his job to expand inclusion and diversity in recruitment, and he takes it very seriously. Everyone in your average police department diversity is something that you aim for but even on college campuses talk about why that's important to have a diverse staff it's important that we have a diverse staff because if you look at looking uh, in, in higher education particularly uh, Indiana University Police Department we, we have a lot of university we have a lot of uh, opportunities right to build long-lasting relationships and we need to make sure that in our hiring processes and practices that not only are we looking for the best candidates, but we're looking for officers who are culturally responsive to the populations we serve because we have uh, students from as far as international, uh, from some marginalized communities uh, as well, huge population and, uh, and women as well at all our campuses across the state. So it's very important to us not only that we look to hire people to replace officers, but we're hiring the best officers that's really culturally responsive to the pop that sense of the population that we serve. I know a lot of people are making moves in light of recent events. Is your position something that's been in the works or is this in response to what we've seen across the country? No, it's been in, uh, it's been in the works. And what I will say to you is uh, we have been a progressive uh, agency uh, over back in 2017, uh, tw year 2017 of October, we formed the uh, de-escalation commission, which I chaired. And what this commission did was look at our, our training. And we looked at our training and we, we said to ourselves, it was sufficient, but we needed to do better. So during that time, when we talk about de-escalation, de-escalation is pretty much woven into all, integrated into all our, our culture of our agency that's embra that embraced that. And one of the things that came out of that was we saw the need that we needed to be consistent with making sure officers received mental health first aid training throughout the agency. Uh, and we sent four people. We invested into that. We sent four people to mental health instructor school to come back and train our officers in mental health first aid. We also purchased a virtual simulator, which is a scenario-based simulator, not shoot, don't shoot, but it's scenario-based. So we put officers on that to see how they would respond and react to different scenarios. And not all of them is, is, is pulling your weapon. A lot of it too is de-escalation and talking to somebody. Uh, one of the other things we did was also fair and impartial policing training and procedural justice uh, training as well. It integrated that into our culture. Now, this was several years ago. We looked at our response to resistance policy and made updates to that where we prohibit chokeholds, but we also put a part in our officer intervention and for officer you know, the officer using excessive force, they have to report it. We'll report it to a supervisor. We're giving officers the, the resources to respond to volatile situations. We're now always having to run in. If they can de-escalate, to de-escalate, and deadly force is, a, is, a last, is the last option for us. And as someone with, you know, what, 18, 17 years of experience in law enforcement, how do you feel seeing everything happen and all the action and all of the uh, police departments trying to reevaluate procedures and reevaluate how they interact in the public. Um, how um, how do you feel about seeing all that? I think uh, you know I, I talk from my uh, my experience and personal opinion. It, we should we should never have to look at our policies and procedures as it relates to training and, and things like that when it, when crises occur. Right? We know that that happened. We should always be looking two to three years ahead looking at best practices, the national standards, meet no standards, but also working with other departments as well to see what, what they're doing too. Um, what, what's happened, what has unfolded over the last few months uh, in this country has been uh, very sad. 
uh, and even George Floyd, that was the tipping point really of systematic and institutional uh, racism that has been going on in, in, this, in this country for, for quite some time. I think as law enforcement officers, we need to be open to those different perspectives and working more closely with our community partners, and in our case, our campus partners with our faculty, staff, and students, but also the communities we serve, because we serve uh, some of those demographics in urban environments, such as Gary, uh, Indianapolis, South Bend, and others, where we're integrated into the community as well. So it's more important for us to, to utilize those resources and build those legitimate relationships, intentional, but in making sure we maintain a consistency as well. The university police is also planning to develop a chief community advisory board. Yeah, so the goal is to bring together division leaders into the conversation to develop ways to improve police operations at all university campuses.